All right, so let's get started then. So first thing we'll do is um, we will do something called the factor theorem. All right, so factor theorem. Um, yeah, so this is something that I alluded to at the end of last class. Um, so now let's actually make it rigorous and formalize what it is. So it is a theorem. So a theorem is just kind of like a mathematical statement that follows from the definitions. Okay, so in mathematics, you have the definitions and from these definitions, you can prove statements and that's what a theorem is. All right. So here's the statement of the theorem. I'm Mr. Roberts. Hey, how are you? Yeah, how are you? <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's a statement of the factor theorem. So it states that um, if x minus k um, is a factor of a polynomial uh, p of x, so that's usually the variable that we use for a polynomial, a p of x, um, then, so what's the conclusion? If x minus k is a factor of a polynomial, um, the conclusion is then p of k, so the polynomial evaluated at the number k, is, is zero. Okay. Okay, and we also have the other direction of this logical implication. The other direction is true. And what I mean is we also have, if P of K is equal to zero, we also have the, the conclusion that then um, X minus K is a factor of P of X. Okay, so we have like both directions of this if then statement Okay, it's like if x minus k is a factor, then p of k is zero. And we also have the converse is true. If p of k is zero, then x minus k is a factor. All right, so this is a, a biconditional statement. Okay, so if anyone's familiar with logic, that's what it is. Okay, so that's the theorem. Um, and let me just write a small piece of terminology that we're going to be using. Um, K is called a zero or root of P of X if P of K is zero. Okay, so that definition should seem pretty natural. Um, so we call the number K a zero or a root of the polynomial if P evaluated at K return zero. All right. So I'm just going to be using that terminology throughout tonight's class. I just want to make sure we're all familiar with it. All right. Okay, so we also just have, I just want to call upon this, this fact from uh, last class. So the fact was, um, if p of x over x minus k has zero remainder. So if the remainder of that division is, is zero, um, then, so maybe you guys remember this from last class, if p of x divided by x minus k has zero remainder after doing the long division or synthetic division, um, then x minus k is a factor of the numerator p of x. Okay, so that was from last class. And then we can actually invoke the factor theorem from above. So remember, if x minus k is a factor of p of x, what do we know then by the factor theorem? By the factor theorem, um, p of k is equal to zero. Okay, so that was uh, the theorem up there. It's like if x minus, so if so, pretty much the, the statement is that if p of x over x minus k has zero remainder, then k, this k value, is actually a zero of the polynomial. It's a root of p of x. 
right? So that's like a good, so that's an easy way to check for um, zeros. Okay. All right, so let's actually use this theorem. How do we apply this in practice? What is this theorem uh, good for? So here's the example. So let's just kind of work through this together nice and slowly, okay? So here's, here's the question. So um, I'm asking you, show that um, x plus two, show that x plus two is a factor of, um, of, okay, so here's the polynomial, x to the third power minus six x to the second power minus x plus 30. And so there's a second piece of this and, and then uh, find the zeros of it. Okay. Okay, so this is a very uh, typical pre-calculus question. Okay, it's, um, so let me just state the question again. <clears throat> I, I would like for you to show me that x plus two is a factor of this polynomial, x cubed minus six x squared minus x plus 30. And then I want you to find the zeros of this guy. Okay, so you're gonna see that the first part of the question is going to help us with the second part. Okay. So what do I need to do to show that x plus two is a factor? Well, I need to do the polynomial division and make sure that the remainder is zero. Then x plus two will be a factor. All right, so first, so first you do, so in this case, I'm gonna do synthetic division, synthetic division. Okay, so I need to make sure in order to check to see if x plus two is a factor, I need to make sure that when I do the division, the remainder is zero. All right, so I'm going to set up this synthetic division, okay? So remember, I place the, uh, the coefficients of our polynomial in this top row. So one, negative six, negative one, and 30. So hopefully that seems familiar from last class. So, and then I put like this, this box thing here and I put my k value outside. So k here is actually going to be negative two. So be careful, k is negative two. All right, so let me just write that here. k is negative two. Sorry. Okay, so let's just kind of carry out this synthetic division, okay? So, so you bring down this one, that comes here. Now I do one times negative two, which is negative two. Then I add up this column. I, I do negative six plus negative two, which is negative eight. Cool, then I, do, then I do negative eight times negative two, which is 16. Add up this column, I will get 15. 15 times negative two is negative 30. Add up this column, 30 plus negative 30, that is zero. Okay, so the fact that this remainder is zero, that tells us that x plus two is a factor of the, of the given polynomial, all right? So let me just write that. So the remainder is zero, and okay, that's the remainder. It's that last number you get. Um, so the remainder is zero. Uh, so um, x plus two is a factor. Okay, so that's done. So we did the first piece of the question. Um, so what's the other factor? So basically we have written P of X, P of X is equal to X plus two times Q of X. And this other factor is actually precisely the quotient that you get. That's how you get this other factor. Okay, it's, so Q of X, um, is, is, is the quotient. All right. So we have the, so we have the following, uh, factorization. So. so we have the following, um, factorization. 
Okay, so what was our original polynomial? It was x cubed minus 6x squared minus x plus 30. Okay, so it's equal to x plus 2 times q of x, but q is just the quotient we got after doing the division. Okay, so the quotient here, you just, the, the, so the, this, this, these numbers, 1, negative 8, 15, those are the coefficients of our quotient. Okay, so the quotient is going to be 1x squared minus 8x plus 15. All right, so here is a reason why synthetic division and polynomial long division is very useful. We can get factorizations of our polynomials. All right, so please stop me if you don't see how I obtained this right side, this highlighted thing. How was I able to factor our given polynomial? So um, just please let me know if this is not clear. All right, so I'm guessing everyone's okay. Um, so I will keep going with the question. So remember the second part of the question was to find the zeros of this guy. We want to find the zeros of that. Well, it's finding the zeros of this is the same as finding the zeros of that, okay, because they're equal. Um, so I can, so we can actually factor further this quadratic on the right side, okay? Um, so let me just write that. So we can, um, so we can actually quite easily um, factor, factor the quadratic. And by the quadratic, I mean this guy right here. Okay, so this will equal, so the x plus 2 just comes down. Okay, would someone like to supply me with this, with the factorization of the quadratic? Would someone like to tell me what to fill in? Negative five, negative three. Yes. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Exactly. So this quadratic here will factor as um, x minus three times x minus five. Excellent. Okay, and this was that technique of finding two numbers that add to negative eight, but and also multiply to 15. And the numbers that do that are negative three and negative five. So that's how I got those. All right, um, and this is very easy now. Um, so the zeros, so the zeros are, okay, so remember the zero product property? We can just set each factor equal to zero. All right, so I'm just gonna write out the final answer. It's x is equal to negative two, x is equal to positive three, and x is equal to positive five. Okay, so I'm just gonna write, I'm not gonna do this every time, but in parentheses, this is, this is by um, the zero product property, all right? So I hope everyone remembers what that is. It just allows me to um, solve this thing when it's set equal to zero by setting each factor equal to zero and solving. Um, yeah, so it looks like we have completed the question, okay? So that's kind of nice. We were given this third degree polynomial that we don't have any formulas for. Um, so there actually is a formula to solve a third degree polynomial, but it's very nasty and disgusting looking. You don't want to use it. It's like the quadratic formula times five, it's like in terms of complexity. Um, so you don't want to use that cubic formula. But we were able to still find the zeros of the cubic um, using this procedure. All right, so any questions? So this was kind of an involved example and, and you'll be asked to do this on your own on the homework and exam. We're gonna do another example. Okay, so I'll move on if that's okay. <clears throat> okay, next. So it's gonna be very similar, very similar. All right, suppose Suppose that it 
is suppose that it is known that um, x equals 2 is a 0 of p of x is equal to x cubed plus 4x squared minus 4x minus 16. Okay, so I'm telling you guys, x equals 2 is a 0 of this. All right, if I plug in 2 into this polynomial, I will get 0. All right, and the question is, or the task is to find the remaining zeros. Okay, find the remaining zeros. Okay, so so how, how are we going to do this? Um, we would like to factor and split our cubic equation into like a linear factor multiplied by a quadratic. Um, so how can we do this? We can actually use our theorem from before. Okay, so let me scroll up to the factor theorem. If p of k is equal to zero, then x minus k is a factor of p of x. Well, we know that p of two is zero. So we know that um, p of 2 is 0. So x minus 2 is a factor of p of x by the factor theorem. So I hope everyone's seeing how I'm getting this. Yeah, well, actually, hold on, let me, I'm actually. Let me just move this down. So, so this is actually a part of the solution. It's not a part of the question. Okay, so it was given to us that x equals two is a zero. So by the factor theorem, x minus two is a factor, okay? Okay, so um, we can do division to find the remaining factor. Okay, because that's how you find the remaining factor. You have to do this polynomial division. Okay, so we'll do synthetic division with k being positive 2. All right, so, uh, so here's the setup. It's 1, 4, negative 4, negative 16. And I'm getting those numbers by reading off the coefficients of p of x. 1, 4, negative 4, negative 16. And the k value we're using is positive 2. OK, excellent. So let, so let me just carry, carry out this procedure. So 1 comes down. 2 times 1 is 2. 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 times 2 is 12. Negative 4 plus 12 is 8. 8 times, 8 times 2 is 16. And as expected, we do have a remainder of 0. Okay, This should not be a surprise, since we knew already that x minus 2 was a factor. All right. So let me just write that. So as expected, as expected, the remainder is 0. OK, and why is it expected? Well, because we already knew that x minus 2 was a factor of it, OK? And if x minus 2 is a factor, then the remainder after division is 0. OK, and the quotient, so what's the quotient here? It's going to be uh, x squared plus 6x plus 8 gives us the other factor, just like before. So the quotient is, will always give you that other factor, gives us the other factor. So I hope everyone is still with me. Just please stop me if anyone's lost, OK? OK, so let me write out the factorization. Thus, we have factored our original guy, x cubed plus 4x squared minus 4x minus 16 
We have just obtained a factorization for this, okay? It's kind of, I guess, the same way. Okay, so we just obtained a factorization of this. And what is it? Well, it's going to, firstly, it's going to consist of x minus 2. It's going to be x minus 2. Multiplied by what? It's multiplied by the quotient that we got, which is this guy. So we've just factored our third degree polynomial. Okay. Okay, so we're actually in a very similar case to before. Again, the quadratic, that thing in the second set of parentheses. Um, the quadratic, again, is easily factorable. Uh, yeah, easy, easily factorable. Okay, so first, first of all, the x minus 2 comes down unchanged. Okay, so the, the factorization of the quadratic, I need two numbers that add to 6 and multiply to 8, and the numbers that work here are positive 4 and positive 2. Okay, so this highlighted quadratic has turned into x plus 4 times x plus 2, and now it should be very easy to list the zeros of this guy. So we just use a zero product property. So the zeros are, all right, you just set each factor equal to zero. Um, so it's going to be x equals 2, x equals minus 4, and x equals minus 2. And that's the answer. All right, so any questions? I'm not really hearing from anyone. I, I, I hope uh, it's either everyone's totally understanding or um, people are lost and don't want to say anything, which is okay. You can always reach out to me at, at another time. But yeah, just please feel free to ask questions. All right. Okay, so that's going to conclude this little factor theorem part. Um, so you, you can expect a question like example, like these two examples on homework and exam. Okay, okay we're going to start now with the second thing of the night, which is the rational zero theorem. So this is also a very nice, uh, very nice theorem. So the rational, let me just clean that up. Okay, so we're starting a new section of the rational, the rational zero theorem. Okay. Okay, so I first need to tell you what it means for a number to be rational. And I'm actually going to ask one of you guys to maybe offer me a definition. Okay, so can someone maybe explain to me uh, intuitively or rigorously, whatever you, uh, whatever you think, uh, what, is, what, what is a rational number? Does anyone remember this? Um, so we have like whole numbers, we have natural numbers, we have real numbers. Does anyone, but we also have this other class of numbers called rational numbers. Does anyone know the definition? I'm not sure, but I think it's maybe like all numbers that are not like the irrational, like that's all oh, that doesn't make sense. But the ones with the I, that's uh, the I forgot the name, but all the others like fractions and like one, two, three, and negative numbers, everything, but the rational ones. Uh, okay, well, you said one good, you, well. Everything you said was good, but you said one key word, uh, fractions. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So fractions is good. So, and also Saeed wrote in the chat fractions with expressions. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't sure if it wasn't perfect, but I, I was actually going to say, like, yeah, is it any number that can be expressed as, like, a quotient or, um, what's that other word for? Yeah, 
Yes, practice. yes, pretty much. So both of you guys have like come together and pretty much gave me the definition. So now let me just make it rigorous. So it's a number that's of the form. Um, so let me just write this down. It's very good. So a number is said to be uh, rational if it is of the form. Okay, here we go. It's of the form A over B, where A and B are integers, and B is not zero, of course. We always need to stipulate um, that we're not dividing by zero, okay? Denominator cannot be zero. Okay, so it's all numbers that can be expressed as an integer divided by another integer. Okay, so let me just give you some quick examples. Um, 1 over 2, 4, 7 over 8, and negative 41 over 85 are all rational numbers. Okay, so they're numbers that can be expressed as a, a fraction of whole, of whole numbers, okay? And also just a non-example. Uh, so the number pi, which is approximately 3.14159, repeat, um, and it goes on forever, is not rational, okay? So the number pi, which has to do with circles and find and the circle's diameter, um, it's not rational. It cannot be expressed as a fraction of A over B. Okay. All right, so I hope we're all cool with the concept of rational numbers. All right, so this is now going to lead us into um, the theorem the statement of the theorem. So here we go. So here's the rational zero theorem. Okay, so here's the statement. <clears throat> All right, so it's just a little bit of writing. Bear with me and then I'll explain it. All right, so if If the polynomial p of x, which in its most general form is going to look like this, p of x equal to a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a1 x plus a sub 0. So this is a polynomial. This is like the definition of a polynomial. So if p of x has integer coefficients, integer coefficients, then every rational zero of p of x, okay, is of the form p over q, where p is a factor of the constant term a sub 0, and q and q is a factor of the leading coefficient a sub n. Ooh, all right, a lot of writing.
Okay, so pretty much this is telling us that if we have a, a, a rational zero, so it's a zero of the polynomial, that's a rational number, it must be of the form a factor of p, I mean a factor of a sub zero divided by a factor of a sub n. Okay, so we need to actually use this theorem in practice to fully understand it. So let's, um, let's just jump right into an example using this theorem. Okay, so the, so the question is list, or the prompt is list the possible rational zeros, list, list the possible rational zeros of p of x is equal to uh, 2x to the fourth minus 5x cubed minus x squared plus 4. Okay, so, so by the rational zero theorem, so by the rational zero theorem, which is the theorem just above, um, the rational zeros of p of x are of the following form. <clears throat> okay, so we can list every single possible rational zero um, using this theorem here. So remember, it's looking up at the theorem, it's, the, it's all the factors of the constant term, a sub zero, divided by the fact, all the factors of the leading coefficient, a sub n. So let me write that. So it's going to be factors of the constant term. So it's going to be factors of four, because that's what the constant term is in this case. Okay, divided by factors of the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient in this example is two. All right, so this is just from the theorem. We know that if we have a rational zero, it's going to be a factor of four divided by a factor of two. All right, so now let me list all these guys. So first of all, the, the factors of four are, Okay, they are plus minus one, plus minus two, and plus minus four. Okay, these are all the numbers that go into four evenly. And you will always need to put a plus minus in front of all of them. We need to consider the negatives too. All right, so, so the, I hope everyone agrees that I've just listed all the factors of four. That's all that's that. So that, that, that's all that is. Um, and now let me list the factors of two because we need that as well. Factors of two are, well, two is just a prime number. So the only factors of it are it and itself, but we also need to consider the negation. So it's plus minus one and also plus minus two. Okay. Okay, good, so this will equal, this will equal. So in the numerator, let me just place all the factors of four. So it's gonna be plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus four, divided by the factors of two, okay? Plus minus one, plus minus two. Okay, and now that I, I know this looks super weird. We have like a fraction with commas in the numerator. Okay, how do we interpret this? Well, you need to do each term in the numerator over each term down here. So you have to do like this over that and this over that and like that over that and so on, okay? So after doing that, you get, so plus minus one over plus minus one, that will just be plus minus one itself. Then you do plus minus one over plus minus two, and that's plus minus one half. 
okay? Then you do uh, plus minus two divided by plus minus one, which is just plus, uh, plus minus two. Then you do plus minus two over plus minus two. That's plus minus one, but that's already on the list. So we don't need to put that again. All right, now we move on to four. You do plus minus four divided by plus minus one. That will be plus minus four. Lastly, you would do plus minus four divided by plus minus two, which is plus minus two, but that's already on the list. So you don't, you don't write it again. So the list is complete. And what is this list? Well, these are the only, these are the only possible rational zeros of P of X. Okay, so I hope everyone sees how I obtained this list. I needed to do one over each thing down here and two over each thing down here and four over each thing down here, okay? Um, I have a question, not how you got there, but like, um, are the possible rational zeros the same as the zeros? Like, that got me a little bit confused. No, because a polynomial can also have a zero that's irrational, irrational, like a polynomial could have a root of the square root of two. But the square root of two is not rational. But when, but all the possible rational zeros are definitely zeros. Oh, I see what you're saying. No, they are not. That, that's literally the next thing I have written in my notes. So not every number listed is a zero of P of X. It's just the, the it's just our possibilities. Yes, so good. So that's literally my next thing here. I have a warning. And it's just that. Um, not, not every number listed. is a zero of p of x okay we've only have we, we only have obtained the possibilities it's possible but it doesn't need to happen not every number listed is a zero and in fact it can also be the case um it may be possible that no number listed will be a zero in fact it may be possible that no number listed will be a zero. Okay, so it could even be the opposite. Nothing will be a zero from this list. Okay, so what do you need to do to check? Well, unfortunately, you just need to manually plug in all of these numbers into P of X and see which one gives you zero. Okay, but I will save you guys that trouble. I already checked. So by um, plugging in, so by plugging in from this list up here. So remember, each plus minus is a separate number. It's positive one, negative one, positive one half, negative one half, and so on. Um, so by plugging in, one can check. One can check that actually x equals one is the only rational zero of, um, yeah, it's the only rational zero of two x to the fourth minus five x cubed minus x squared plus four. Okay, so you, you will need to go and check every number on this list, but I think I'm going to, but I think mainly I will tell you ahead of time which one it will be, okay? Because that is, uh, that, that does take a lot of time and it's kind of annoying to do plugging in all these numbers. Okay, but 
maybe if you have some time, just check, you're, you're gonna plug in every number on this list. The only one that will be, will plug in and return zero will be positive one, okay. Okay, all right, so that, that's it for that example. So any questions on anything so far? We're going to do another applic we're going to do another application of this theorem. Okay, so I guess everyone's okay. I'm going to I'm going to move on. All righty. So um pretty much what we're gonna be doing now, we're gonna be using the rational roots theorem in conjunction with the factor theorem to help us find zeros of polynomials, okay? So let me just write that quickly. Rational roots theorem in conjunction, in conjunction with the factor theorem, so that was the first theorem from today. Can help us. Can help us um, further further factor and find the zeros of polynomials. So let me scroll up to the example above and kind of show you where the factor theorem could have come into play. So remember, we got from the rational roots theorem that x equals one was a zero. Okay, now you apply the factor theorem. If x, if x equals one is a zero, that means by the factor theorem that x minus one is a factor of the polynomial. And then we can do our division, divide by x minus one, and we get a factorization. So that's how these two theorems are used alongside each other. You use the rational roots theorem to find a zero, then you use the factor theorem to um, do division, okay? Right, oh, I wrote rational roots theorem, uh, but I, it's the same thing, but I should just stay consistent and write uh, the rational zero theorem. So it's the same thing, my bad, okay? Same thing, roots and zeros are synonyms in this uh, scenario. All right, so here is, kind of like the big example of the even, okay? This is kind of like uh, why the rational zero theorem is like a thing, like why do we like it? Okay. All right, so here, here we go. So the example is um, find the zeros of p of x is equal to four x cubed, minus three X minus one. Okay, so just note, um, this is not a quadratic. This is not a polynomial of degree two. So we can't use the quadratic formula, okay? We have a polynomial of degree three, which we don't have formulas for. And trust me, you wouldn't even want to use the formula for uh, a degree three. It's very nasty. Um, a much nicer route is to use the rational zero theorem. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So let's kind of start start this off. Uh, Mr. Roberts. Mm -hmm. Well, hold on a second. Let me pause this. Uh, so I'm sorry. So for a quadratic formula, you you wouldn't you you wouldn't plug this into that equation. You would use like a degree of two for it, or no? So if this polynomial was of degree two, mm -hmm. I mean, like if this was four x squared. Uh -huh. um, yeah, you could just immediately use the quadratic formula to, to solve for the zeros. Okay. 
but this is not a degree two, so we cannot use the quadratic formula. Okay. Gotcha. Was that your question? I'm, I'm not. Yes, that was it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so we need to use um, some different tools. And, and how we're going to do it, we're going to use the rational zero theorem in conjunction with the factor theorem. So here we go. So first, first, so first we use the rational zero theorem. to list all possible rational zeros of P of X. Okay, so just like the previous example, remember I had, uh, remember we listed all the possible zeros, rational zeros, let's do it again. So remember what the rational zero theorem tells us it's going to be factors of the constant term divided by factors of the leading coefficient. Okay, all rational zeros are of that form. So it's going to, so let me write that. It's going to be factors of the constant term, which is negative one, divided by factors of four. Okay, so it will be of this form. So I know I'm writing this fraction bar. This is technically not a fraction, but it's supposed to just signify that the, the possible zeros will be a factor of negative one divided by a factor of four. Okay, so let's list all of these factors, okay? The factors of negative one, well, that's very easy. That's just plus minus one. Those are the only factors of negative one. Okay, so that's the numerator. Okay, and now factors of four. Well, that is also, so I think we did this in the previous example. The factors of four are plus minus one, comma, plus minus two, and plus minus four. Those are all the factors of four. Okay, now to get our list, you need to do each thing in the numerator divided by each thing in the denominator, okay? So you need to do one plus minus one divided by plus minus one, plus minus one divided by plus minus two, plus minus one divided by plus minus four. That's how you get your list, all right? So it will be, well, this is not, this is, this is pretty simple since we just have one thing in the numerator. Well, technically two things with a plus minus one, um, but it will be, plus minus one, comma, so that's one over one. Now one over two will be plus minus one half. And one over four will be plus minus one over four. Okay, so I hope everyone sees going from here to here. All right. Good, so we've listed all the possible zeros. Now it's when, now's the time when we actually need to manually plug in to our polynomial and check which of these is actually a zero, if any. All right, so this is, I think, kind of like the boring and annoying part, but I will save you, um, I'll save you the trouble. So from this list, from this list, we need to, we need to plug into P of X and see if any are zero. Okay, because remember this list are just possible rational zeros. They're not all going to be zeros and sometimes none of them may be zeros, okay? All right, so let's just do that. So what's the first thing on our list? And let's just hope that we get lucky. The first thing on our list is plus one. All right, so let's, so let's plug that in to the polynomial. So P of one. Okay, so it's gonna be four times one to the third minus three times one minus one. And this is actually, this is actually zero. So that's awesome. We don't, we can stop right there. 
All right, so we got lucky with that one. Thus, one is a zero of p of x, okay? However, if one was not a zero, you would need to keep going in this list and plugging in to see which ones are zeros, okay? But in this case, it was uh, the first thing we tried. All right, good. So we have just concluded that one is a zero. Excellent. Now we use the factor theorem. So this is the second piece. We use the factor theorem now. Now we use the factor theorem. And we do it as such. So since x equals one is a zero of p of x, it implies that. So this is directly from the factor theorem. Since x equals 1 is a 0 of p, it implies that x minus 1 is a factor of p. Okay, and that's directly from the factor theorem. So I hope everyone sees that reasoning, how I'm, how I'm making this um, deduction here. I'm just using the factor theorem. Okay, what is it? Okay, so, so in other words, uh, that is our polynomial P of X, it can be rewritten as X minus one multiplied by some polynomial Q of X. That's what it means when something is a factor of a polynomial. It means that it's written as X minus one times some other guy, some other polynomial Q of X. Okay, so that's what that means by definition. Okay, how do we find Q of X? We need to find Q of X. To find Q of X, um, so just like we did earlier, you do division and we can do synthetic division, okay? You do synthetic, you do synthetic division. Two computes. So what are we doing? We're doing P of X over X minus one, okay? That's how you find this other guy, Q of X. You, right, you have to do uh, a division and we do synthetic division since we're in the case when that's allowed. All right, very good. So what's P of X? Let me scroll up here. We have to take the coefficients, four, zero, zero, negative three, negative one. Okay, so we set up the division, it's four, zero, negative three, negative one. Let me just make sure we're, we're good with that. Yeah. Okay, so just make note here, we, we have a zero there because there's no x squared term in our polynomial. We need to take account for that. That's why there's a zero there. So that was from last class. All right, good, now we, put this box thing and we do our K value. K here is positive one. K is positive one. All right, and now we just have to carry out the division. So bring down the four, you get four. Four times one is four, add up the column. Zero plus four is four. Four times one is four. Negative three plus four is positive one. One times one is one, add up the column, negative one plus one is zero. It should not be surprising that we got a remainder of zero since we already knew that x minus, x minus one was a factor, okay? All right, so we just figured out the quotient. Thus, Q of x is equal to, so remember, you just have to read off these numbers. These are the coefficients of your quotient. Okay, so it'll be 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. So we have just obtained the factorization. 4x cubed minus 3x minus 1. This factors as x minus 1, and we just figured out q of x. It's just this quadratic here. 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. 
Okay. So that went there. This, this is Q of X. This is highlighted portion. All right. So is everyone okay? Any questions? So let's not lose track of the goal. The goal is we want to find all the zeros of this polynomial, and that's equivalent to finding the zeros of this right side, okay? And that's good now. So now we have a quadratic, which we have tools for. We can use the quadratic formula on, on this guy, okay? So, so now we're in the home stretch. Uh, to find the remaining roots, use the quadratic formula on 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. Okay. So I'm just going to set this up very quickly. So quadratic formula tells us x is equal to negative 4 plus or minus the square root. And what goes in the square root? It's going to be b squared minus 4 times a, which is 4, times c, which is 1. And divide that by 2 times the leading coefficient, so divided by 8. All right, so I'm going to move through the quadratic formula portion kind of fast. Um, because you, because I, I trust that you guys can go back and check this. Okay. All right, and the discriminant or this expression in the square root is actually just zero. So we get negative four plus or minus the square root is zero over eight. And in other words, this will be equal to negative four over eight, which is uh, negative one half. Okay, so we just, so this plus minus does not matter in this specific example because you're doing plus minus zero. So you just get one root. one root. All right, so we're done. Thus, thus the zeros of P of X are um, X equals one and X equals negative one half. Right, so that's an application of the rational roots theorem in all of its glory, right? All right, so any questions? Would it be positive one half? Just the other one half? Is it the zero product property rule? Um, so we're not, so, Right, so by the zero product property, it means that x minus one is equal to zero, or this guy is equal to zero. x squared plus four x plus one is equal to zero. We solved this with the quadratic formula. Got it. Yeah. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking of when we factor it into two linear factors, yeah. But good, we did use a zero product property implicitly. I didn't state it. Okay, very good, very good. Any other questions? I really like when you guys ask questions, so please feel free. All right, so I guess we're okay. Um, we're gonna move on now. So we're gonna close the book on division, uh, polynomial division and zeros. Um, and now we're going to move on to asymptotes. And we're going to do a nice introduction to asymptotes. And we should be able to end in maybe like 10, 15 minutes. Okay, from now. All right. So we're going to move on. So we are going to start uh, the next topic, um, asymptotes. Asymptotes. All right, 
So we're going to start off with a definition. Okay, what is an asymptote? Okay, so here is the definition. So a line, I'll call it L, is said to be, is said to be an, is said to be an asymptote of a curve f of x if, if the distance between L and f of x, if the distance between L and f of x approach zero as x approaches infinity, or x approaches minus infinity, or as f of x approaches infinity, or f of x approaches minus infinity. Okay, so I'm using that notation from the polynomial end behavior PDF. Um, so maybe you guys got a chance to read that or you didn't read it yet, but uh, don't worry about it too much. Okay, so this is what an asymptote is formally. I think it's a lot better understood with a picture. So let's go to that. Whoops, my bad. Hold on. Copy. Yes, there we go. Okay. So um, here we have asymptotes, um, and they're notated with these dotted lines. Okay. So you can see that um, as our function shoots off to positive infinity, it's the distance between the curve and this dotted line is becoming zero. It's getting infinitely close or arbitrarily close to this dotted line. The curve and the dotted line are getting as close to each other as we want. Okay, And also, as x goes to infinity, as we travel on the x-axis towards the right, um, the curve is getting infinitely close to the line y equals zero. That's an asymptote. And we have similar behavior going on here. As the curve shoots off to minus infinity, it's getting arbitrarily close to this line. And as x goes to negative infinity, it's getting arbitrarily close to y equals zero line. All right, so I hope everyone is maybe seeing what I mean when I write x goes to infinity, x goes to minus infinity, and so on. All right, so the asymptotes here are the dotted lines. All right, so in the above example, So in the above example, um, we have asymptotes, asymptotes at, um, at these lines. Um, so it's at y equals 0 and x equals 3. Okay. So an asymptote, by definition, is a line. Okay. So they will be lines. Can you scroll up real quick to the definition? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right, so now we're just going to hone in on the specific case of a vertical asymptote, okay? Vertical asymptotes. Okay, definition. A vertical asymptote, asymptote is, well, first of all, it's an asymptote, obviously, um, of the form x equals a. So it's a vertical line. 
so that is, so in other words, so when I write that is, that's kind of just means like in other words, um, that is um, the asymptote is a vertical line. All right, so remember from like a few weeks ago, vertical lines are of the form x equals a, right? So x equals three in our previous, previous example in this picture, that, that's a vertical asymptote. It's a vertical line. All right, so we wanna figure out um, how to find vertical asymptotes given a function, okay? So there's some algebraic procedure you can do. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at rational functions in particular, so a polynomial divided by a polynomial. All right, so here, here's how it works. So here's, here's the fact. But the line never reaches the asymptote though. Okay, in this example, yes, it will never touch the asymptote. You're right. However, it is possible, um, there are examples out there where the graph can cross the asymptote infinitely many times. Mm -hmm. So it actually is allowed to touch it and cross. Okay. The, the only stipulation is that the distance between the curve and the asymptote must get arbitrarily small. Okay. Yeah. Like it will never equal it though, I mean. No, it, it can equal it because if it crosses it, then they're, then they're equal. Okay. Yeah, so they can equal each other. But just in this example, no, they don't, it never, it never reaches it. Yes, exactly. So in this picture, you can kind of just visually see it's, it's, it's gonna just ride up along, but never touch the asymptotes, yes. But I just wanna tell you that it is possible for a graph to cross an asymptote. In fact, it can cross an asymptote in, um, infinitely many times. There are some nice examples out there of that. Mm. Yeah, so that's a good question because that's a common misconception. Good. Okay, so now let's go back to vertical asymptotes. So, so basically, this is how it works. For a rational function, it has vertical asymptotes at zeros of the denominator. Okay, so I'm not finished. Zeros of the denominator that are not zeros of the numerator. So they're only zeros of the denominator that are not zeros of the numerator. Okay, so given a rational function, I hope we remember what a rational function is. It's a polynomial divided by a polynomial. It will have vertical asymptotes at the zeros of the denominator that are not also zeros of the numerator. Okay, so that's, um, that's, so that's the procedure. That's how you find vertical asymptotes. All right, so here we go. So let's just jump into an application. Um, find, find the vertical, find the vertical asymptotes of x minus two over x squared minus four. Okay. All right, so first of all, um, we need to find zeros of the denominator that are not zeros of the numerator. Well, first, let's just make our lives easier and, and factor, okay? So by factoring the denominator, Denom, denominator. What do we get? Well, x minus two stays the same. And x squared minus four, that's a difference of two squares. So that's just going to factor as x minus two multiplied by x plus two. So we didn't do anything yet. We just factored the denominator, okay? Okay, so we need to find the zeros of the denominator that are not zeros of the numerator. Okay, so firstly, the zeros of the denominator 
Okay, so the zeros of the denominator, I hope you guys can see pretty easily, they are two and negative two. Our x equals two and x equals minus two. Okay, but, or however, x equals two is also a zero of the numerator. Of the numerator. Okay, I hope you guys see that x equals two is also a zero of the numerator. It's a zero of both the denominator and numerator. Okay, so it's not a vertical asymptote, okay? So x equals two is not a vertical asymptote. Okay, but x equals minus two is a zero of the denominator. That's not a zero of the, of the numerator. So, but x equals negative two is a vertical asymptote. Alrighty, so that's it. That's how you do it. You find zeros of the denominator that are not zeros of the numerator. Okay, so I do have just, just a set of steps. Um, maybe I'll type it and it'll be kind of faster. Let's see. Yeah, all right, so here, let, let, let's try something new. So here are the steps to uh, steps on finding um, vertical asymptotes. Okay. Just give me a second, hold on. Okay, so here are the steps. So step one. Okay, step one, step one. Um, so first you factor the numerator and denominator. That's step one. Step two will be to cancel any common factors in the numerator and denominator. Okay. And then step three, the last step, any x values that cause a zero in the denominator of the simplified version will be a will be um, vertical asymptotes. Okay. So just going up to this example, look, we, we, we actually could have canceled x minus two and x minus two. Now, step three is any x values that cause a zero in the simplified version, the simplified version would have been one over x plus two. You look at the zeros of the denominator of this guy, which has x is equal to negative two. All right. All right. So that's the procedure. It's, it's, it's really not that. I don't, I don't think it's that bad. So that will be it for vertical asymptotes. Um, and this is something that will, that can be explained using the tools of calculus and, and limits. So if you go on to Calc 1, you can kind of make this more rigorous. Okay. Last thing, last thing of the evening, we're going to be doing uh, removable discontinuities. Removable discontinuities. Okay, definition. So a rational function has a removable discontinuity 
So that's the word I'm defining, so I'll underline it. It has a removable discontinuity at x equals a if x equals a is both a zero of the numerator and denominator. Numerator and denominator. Um, and I'll just put in parentheses just to be formal of the same multiplicity, um, but don't worry too much about that. Um, but that's just to keep it rigorous. Same multiplicity just means that the zero is raised to the same power in the top and bottom. So like, for instance, x minus one to the third power, x equals one would be a zero of multiplicity three. Okay. That's, so that's what it means. And these have the same multiplicity in the top and bottom. Don't, I would not uh, stress about this, but yeah. So x minus one to the third, that is x equals one to zero of multiplicity three. Okay, so that's pretty much it. You just have to look at the shared zeros of the numerator and denominator. Um, so we're just gonna go back to the previous example. Okay, in the, actually, should I show you the picture now? Yeah, so actually, hold on, hold on. Let me just show you the, let me show you what the picture looks like first, excuse me. What does a removable discontinuity look like? Okay, so a removable discontinuity is, so ignore this vertical asymptote right here. We're not looking at that. It's, it's this little hole in the graph, okay? So the name kind of describes what the picture looks like. It's just a little removable point that, that's plucked out of the graph, okay? So that's, that's what a removable discontinuity looks like graphically. It's just a little puncture in the curve will pop, okay? So um, now let's return to the previous example, okay? In the previous example of x minus two over x squared minus four, um, x equals positive two is a zero of the numerator and denominator, okay? Is a zero of both the numerator and denominator, okay? I hope that is clear. They both have the same multiplicity one, but don't worry too much about that. So, it is a removable discontinuity. So x equals two is a removable discontinuity. All right, so it's just shared zeros of the numerator and denominator, okay? Okay, we're gonna finish off with one example, one quick example. Yes. You would all, to confirm that it's, that two is also a zero of the numerator, you just set the, the top to the zero? Yep, exactly. You set the top and bottom equal to zero okay. and, and solve, absolutely. All right, here we go, final example. Um, so state any vertical asymptotes and removable discontinuities of, 
So we're always going to be looking at rational functions here. Polynomials divided by polynomials. So f of x is equal to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, x plus 3 divided by x squared plus 5x plus 6. Okay, so I actually like the technique that Saeed just said. Let's set the top and bottom equal to zero and solve. I like that. So, so we have to solve uh, two equations. You solve two equations. And the equations are, well, you set the numerator equal to zero and the denominator. So we, we have to solve x plus three is equal to zero numerator and the denominator equal to zero, which is x squared plus five x plus six is equal to zero. All right, then we need to examine which zeros are shared, which are only zeros of the denominator and so on. We need to classify them. Okay, so this left equation, x plus three is zero, that's quickly solvable to be x equals minus three. So I hope that's, that's okay. And this guy, this quadratic, we can factor. Um, so this will factor as, um, right, so this will factor as x plus 2 multiplied by x plus 3 equals 0. Yes, x squared plus 3x, yeah. Now use the zero product property on this guy. And that's going to be easily be solutions uh, that, that, that will easily give us solutions of x equals negative 2 and x equals negative 3. Excellent. Now, removable discontinuities, first of all, let's start with that. They will be zeros that are shared between the numerator and denominator. And the zeros that are shared, you can see, are x equals negative 3. Okay, So x equals negative 3 is a shared zero of the numerator and denominator. So it is a removable discontinuity. All right, so that's, that just follows by the definition of a removable discontinuity. So that's that. Very good. And now, what about vertical asymptotes? Well, recall, they will be zeros of the denominator that are not zeros of the numerator. OK, the zeros of the numerator are just negative 3 and the zeros of the denominator are negative 2 and negative 3. Negative 2 is a zero of the denominator that's not a zero of the numerator. So that's going to be our um, vertical asymptote. Okay. I don't like that color. So um, oh, what was I going to ask? Are there going to be two removable discontinuities or just one? There's just one. It's just the shared zeros of the numerator and denominator. Okay. But the zero of the denominator that's not a zero of the numerator will be our vertical asymptote. So x equals negative 2 is a zero. So I'm just going to write this out, just be very explicit. x equals negative 2 is a zero of the denominator and not. and not a zero of the numerator. So x equals negative 2 is a vertical asymptote. 